Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kohi Game Engine series. Today we're going to begin tackling the graphics pipeline and we're going to get started with that right now. But before we do, I would like to take a quick second and thank the supporters of the channel, beginning with our partners, AR Slia, Wen Sheng, Caden, and Patrick. Uh, they are the partners of the channel, which is the highest tier of support for the channel. So thank you very much for that. And I would also like to thank all the other supporters listed here on the screen. Your support is very much appreciated. So thank you for that. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can find links in the description to YouTube memberships, as well as my Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash Travis Roman. Anyway, with that stuff out of the way, the first thing I would like to touch on before we actually jump into this is if you have not seen the live stream that I did earlier this week, uh, I would recommend that you go ahead and check that out. I will leave a link in the description as well as a card so that you can easily access that. In that live stream, we did a bunch of work where we fixed some issues in the code base, uh, refactored a few things, and so forth. And one of the main things that we did was we changed the way that the uh, state is held for a bunch of the various subsystems. And I didn't get all the way through that. So I actually went ahead and finished a lot of that work off camera. So uh, I just wanted to sort of show really quickly here on the screen some of that additional work that I did uh, off camera just because I didn't feel that it sort of warranted a video on its own. So um, they all follow the same pattern. The explanation of that pattern is in the live stream. So uh, if you're interested in that, I would highly suggest you check that out and then come back here. So uh, the other things that I converted over to uh, use that is the event system, the input system platform, and the, uh, the renderer system. Those things have all been changed over to use uh, the new memory model. And uh, most of this commit is actually uh, focused around that. So uh, there's a couple of commits that I did. Uh, this is probably the largest one where uh, I went through and, and changed a whole bunch of stuff on there. I know I'm scrolling this really fast. I don't actually expect you guys to read it. So uh, I should also point out that, uh, like I said, there are a couple of things in here um, that I did fix as well. Uh, so I found uh, that the key code splitting for Win32 was not quite done yet. Um, and so I actually put a couple commits in to fix some of that stuff. Uh, and I'll quickly show that uh, the final version of that here in a second. And then I also fixed an issue with the clock uh, for the unit test. Because if you recall in the live stream, it was showing as zero for all the unit tests, which is obviously not correct. And I found and fixed the reason for that. So if you're interested in the details of those things, uh, you can find them here on uh, the repo and all those fixes are there. Uh, I should also mention that going forward, anytime that there are fixes like that, uh, I probably will start sort of silently putting them in here instead of dedicating a whole video to them. And I'll just quickly mention them uh, just for the sake of brevity and time. So um, I do wanna keep this series moving, so I don't wanna spend tons of time uh, going over fixes. But with all that said, Let's go ahead and take a look at the code here. So uh, the one thing that I wanted to point out in input, uh, it was actually on the Win32 platform code, uh, which is not gonna highlight right now, uh, only because I'm actually recording this video from Linux. Uh, I've greatly simplified uh, this section of code uh, in determining the left and right alt, control and shift keys that were pressed. Uh, we can actually get an extended key code from that um, and that will work for the alt key and the control and then uh, annoyingly the shift has to be done a little bit differently but uh, this is how all of that works so uh, unfortunately the way that the msdn documentation suggested wasn't really the best way to do it and i did uh, double back and did a little bit of research and came up with this instead so this seems to work much better okay so uh, with all that stuff out of the way, uh, I wanna go ahead and jump back into our Vulkan backend. Uh, and we are going to start implementing our new pipeline. So in the last video in the series, we actually set up our sort of build process and our post build process to be able to build shaders. So that way, when we get to that point, uh, we can go ahead and set that up. So today, what I'm actually going to do is really briefly uh, just sort of 
outline what we're going to do and it's going to be probably in several pieces because there's a lot to actually be done here. So one of the first things that we're actually going to do is we are going to set up what we're going to call shaders. And this is a little bit different from Vulkan or OpenGL's uh, definition of shaders in that it actually includes a little bit more than just the shader itself. So at least in Vulkan, generally speaking, uh, you have your shader modules itself, and then you also have a pipeline that is used for the layout of that shader to sort of um, determine how things are laid, how the data is actually laid out um, and translated into the shader, if you will. Uh, and so we're going to include that as well. And then uh, we're also going to uh, set up some buffers to be used with it for our uniforms and so forth. Uh, and all that stuff is actually going to be encapsulated uh, as the shader. So a lot of the work that we're going to be doing is actually going to be uh, within shader files that we're going to create here um, in the project. So without further ado, uh, I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is create those shader files first and then uh, any other sort of files that we need to create along the way we'll split out, uh, we'll split off and do as needed. So uh, I'm going to collapse some of these real quick and under render Vulkan we are going to create a new folder called shaders and underneath that we're going to create a new file and we're going to call it Vulkan object shader .h. Now I should mention that along the way we are going to have uh, several different types of shaders and we are going to have some that are built in and they're always going to work the same way so we can make certain assumptions and hard code certain things and um, you know not necessarily make them as configurable as perhaps a custom shader would be uh, and then uh, aside from that we'll obviously have custom shaders that eventually will be configurable uh, through a graph or a node based editor that we can uh, then create on the fly but one of the first types of shaders that we're going to need is a shader to render objects in the world. So when I say object shader, that is actually what I'm talking about. Um, and that is going to be the first one that we create. Other examples of shaders that we're going to be creating uh, eventually will be like one for terrain, one for skyboxes, things of that nature. So just to give you an idea, um, anytime that we have something that needs to be rendered differently uh, or uses different techniques or perhaps requires a different type of data, we're probably going to go ahead and define a different shader for that. And then uh, from there, um, we will go ahead and, and build those out. And then uh, once we get a little bit further along and we start making things configurable, some of those uh, specialized shader types may wind up disappearing in favor of a configurable shader. But while we're sort of getting things up and running, at least initially, uh, we have to make some assumptions and clamp some things down just to get things up and running. So uh, in our Vulkan object shader, uh, the interface for this is uh, not too complicated. Uh, the first thing that we're going to want, obviously, is going to be uh, a pragma once and then a include for uh, renderer Vulkan Vulkan types, because we're obviously going to need those. And then we're also going to need uh, renderer types. OK, so like many other objects in our system, um, for lack of a better term, we have a create. So we are going to create a shader. And uh, that simply takes the context and a structure which we have not yet created, which is Vulkan object shader. And then obviously, since we have a create, we are also going to have a destroy. And in order to switch back and forth between uh, different shaders as we need them, we are going to do something that OpenGL people might be familiar with called using the shader, which means that basically the next operations that we're going to put through are going to be utilizing this specific shader. So we need a way to do that. In OpenGL, this winds up being a single line of code. And in Vulkan, it is it is also technically a single line of code, but it's a little bit different. So um, this is sort of a way that we can abstract uh, some of that stuff from uh, the rest of the system. OK. And so for right now, that is actually all I'm going to create. We are going to be adding more to this interface. But for right now, I just want to start with these. OK. So uh, the next thing I need to do is create a new file and we'll call that Vulkan object shader C. And we'll take a copy of these methods here and 
paste them here and turn them into function definitions. And then obviously we will need to include Vulcan object shader .h. And uh, there are going to be uh, quite a few things that we're going to have to add to this along the way. So, um, but for now, that's all we actually need. So we're obviously getting this error here about uh, the Vulcan object shader not existing. So let's go ahead and create that. So if we go to Vulcan types, INL, and we will go here uh, towards the bottom. And I think right before context is probably the best place to put this. So we are going to type def a new structure called Vulcan object shader. Okay. And this is what is going to hold um, all of our shader related information. So this will give you an idea of all the things that we need to uh, create for our shader. So uh, one thing that we need is something that we're going to call the Vulcan shader stage. And this is actually a structure which we have not yet created. So right above Vulcan object shader, we'll go ahead and paste in a definition for that. So this is called the Vulcan shader stage. Uh, and in here, we actually have to create uh, stages uh, in Vulcan one by one, right? We need what's called a shader module uh, create info. We need a shader module, which I'll get into that in a little bit. And then a pipeline shader stage create info. Okay, and this is just a structure for us to be able to group those things together uh, so that when we go to create uh, shader stages, uh, we can go ahead and do that. So the next thing that we have here is uh, object shader stage count. This is how many stages this particular shader has. So in our case, that number is going to be two. So we are going to just put a quick define here and set that as two. And those two are going to be vertex and fragment. So uh, you OpenGL guys out there are probably familiar with those two stages. And we will get into those uh, a little bit more as this progresses, okay? So uh, this is what defines the uh, data that is required to create those two stages. The next thing that we're gonna need is something called a pipeline. And I've actually wrapped this up in a Vulkan pipeline struct, which we've not yet created. And uh, this just simply has a handle to a VK pipeline and a VK pipeline layout, right? So it's just a little sort of container to keep those things together. So uh, the Vulkan pipeline is what basically provides uh, the configuration for all the various stages of the shader. So we're gonna need one of those and we'll have to step through creating that. And then uh, from there, I there are gonna be a couple of other things that we're going to need to create, but I think I'm gonna hold off on those until we actually get to that point. So let's go back to our C file and go ahead and get started on this shader create. So, so the first thing we're gonna do is set up a small array of strings just to be able to obtain the various stage names that we need for this particular shader. And we're gonna need those um, for a couple of different things. So you'll see that here in a minute. The next thing that we need is we actually need to store the stage types. And this is uh, VK shader stage flag bits. So in this case, obviously we're gonna have two, which uh, is defined here. And as I mentioned before, we have the shader uh, stage vertex bit and then the fragment bit. So for vertex stage and fragment stage, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we are going to iterate through these and we are going to create what is called a shader module. So a shader module basically contains the logic for programmable shaders, right? So generally speaking, we will be taking a, uh, a file that is compiled via the pipeline we set up in the last video, and we will be loading that bytecode into a shader module, which is then used by a pipeline. So the first thing that we're going to be creating here is called a shader module. And so I'm actually going to paste in some code here that uh, is not yet built out, 
But um, what we're going to do is we're going to create a shader module for each one of these stages that we have defined here. Okay, and we're just going to be passing in the strings, uh, the type, and then uh, obviously the shaders um, array or the stages array that uh, we created before, right? And so just by doing this, we're going to be creating those into that array that we uh, set up before. Now, uh, you'll notice here that there's something here called built-in shader name object. So what does that mean? Well, for our built-in shaders, we are actually going to be naming those shaders specific hard-coded things for the built-in ones. And when I say built-in ones, I mean ones like this that are sort of predefined, that are always gonna work the same way, that are not necessarily configurable. Okay, and so all this is gonna be is built-in dot object shader is what we're gonna call this, right? And this is string. And this is going to wind up being part of the file name that we're then going to load. So if we were loading a custom shader instead of passing in uh, some sort of predefined string like this, we would just um, pass the name of, uh, of the file ultimately uh, that's going to wind up being here. And we're going to wind up uh, concatenating this with the stage and then uh, the extension, which will be uh, defined in uh, this create shader module. So with that said, uh, we actually do not have this create shader module, so we'll need to do that next. Uh, however, before I jump into that, uh, we do have k error here, which means that we do need our logger. So let's go ahead and get that included. And now we need to create this create shader module. However, since we are going to be reusing this code across multiple shaders, uh, I don't want to actually put that in this file because I want to be able to actually reuse that. So what I'm going to do is I am actually going to create a new file under Vulkan and I'm going to call this Vulkan shader utils .h. Okay. And this is actually where we're going to define that. So obviously we will need a pragma once. And for now, all we're gonna do is just include our Vulkan types INL. And then we are going to create one function here, which is our create shader module function. So uh, this takes in the Vulkan context, uh, the name of the shader, the type string, all that stuff that we sort of defined before, okay? And in the utils.c, which we need to create, I'll create a new file. We obviously will need to include Vulkan shader utils.h. And there is actually going to be another piece to this that we're going to need, uh, but we will create that in a second. So we're going to need the logger. We are going to need uh, k string. We are also going to need k memory. And we're going to need one more piece here that I'll get to in a second. So let me go ahead and create the definition here, okay? And the first thing that we're gonna do is we are going to build the file name, okay? And basically this is just a, uh, a predefined uh, file name buffer. I'm using 512 characters here. Um, this is just to sort of an avoid dynamic allocation because I really don't want to to do that um, at this stage if we don't have to. So 512 might not be enough. We might wanna use 1024 instead, but for now I found that 512 is usually enough uh, to include any sane path that you might be creating. So um, we can always come back and, and adjust this later if we want. But we're gonna be using our string format function that we uh, created before. And we're basically going to pass the file name that is in here. And uh, we are going to uh, take this string right here as our format string and uh, insert these two things into it and then write that out to our file name, okay? And uh, that is basically going to give us a, um, a path to our file. Now I do realize, again, there are some assumptions here. Uh, this is a hard-coded path. We probably should put a, um, a base path and pass that in here. For now, I'm not gonna worry about it. We'll change it if and when we get to it. This SPV is the extension that we use for compiled shaders for Vulkan. All right, so next we are going to zero the memory of the create info 
for the appropriate shader stage, right? So we're passing an index here um, and then this array of shader stages. So we're basically just gonna zero that out just to make sure that we don't have sort of any invalid settings in there. And then obviously make sure that the S type is set correctly to shader module create info. And now we need a way to load files and we have not actually tackled this yet. So uh, this is one of those things that uh, we have to sort of divert to be able to, um, to be able to open files. So what we need is something at the platform layer to be able to access files in a platform agnostic way, right? And we're going to set up something very simple just to use right now. And then uh, obviously as time goes on, we will create something that's a little bit more robust. Uh, but for now, we're gonna stick with something simple. So we are gonna detour here a little bit. Um, file input. And we are actually going to go to platform. And under platform, we are gonna create a new file. And we're gonna call this file system .h. Okay, and the file system will have uh, a relatively simple interface. So obviously we'll be starting off with uh, including our defines. And the way that this is going to work, at least initially, is we are going to maintain handles to files, right? And so what I've done here is uh, our file handle is going to be a structure that holds um, a void pointer to a handle because uh, this could very well be different and will be different eventually per platform. Uh, so we just store that in a void pointer and then uh, a quick Boolean to determine if the file handle is actually valid. And that is flipped when uh, the file is actually opened, is determined to be existing. Um, and we can use that to externally check to see if the file handle we currently have is actually valid, okay? Next, uh, we need to define a couple of file modes, I'm gonna call them. So uh, we have read or we have write, and these things could be combined if we need to read and write. Uh, and this is basically determines um, how the actual file is opened. Um, and then next, for most files, uh, you're probably gonna wanna check to see if it exists. So this is just a quick method here to say, does the file at this path exist? And we can also open the file. So uh, file system open is going to take a file path, uh, the mode that we have declared up here. So read or write or both. And then uh, whether or not it is a binary file. So uh, we can open files in sort of a text mode if you're reading a text file or binary if you're reading sort of bytecode, which is what we're gonna be doing um, quite a lot. And then uh, we also have uh, the out handle here that uh, gets created whenever uh, the file is actually opened successfully. So obviously it returns true if success, otherwise false. Since we have an open, that means obviously we need a close. So that just handles that. And then for uh, text type files, so if we're not binary, we need a way to basically read a line of text. So this basically goes up to uh, the carriage return uh, new line or just new line depending on platform. And uh, this just uh, reads an entire line of text and then returns that to a pointer to a character array. Okay. Next, uh, we since we have a way to read a line, we also should probably have a way to write a line. So uh, this basically just does the opposite where it says, uh, okay, here's the file, uh, write this text to a line and then put a uh, new line character afterward. Okay, and then depending on platform, obviously it'll do just a new line or a carriage return new line. Next, uh, we need a way to actually read a certain number of bytes in raw data um, out of a file. And this is typically used when you're reading um, binary files, right? So uh, this file system read reads from the handle that's provided uh, the given number of bytes, and then it takes a void pointer to the out data. Um, so this could technically be any type of data. We can, um, we're gonna be using this quite a lot actually, and you guys will see how this works. Um, and then uh, we also get uh, a pointer to hold the number of bytes that were actually read. 
And of course, uh, this returns a Boolean as to whether or not that read was successful. All right, and then uh, just for convenience, uh, there are gonna be some cases where we're gonna wanna read all bytes of the file. Uh, and this is actually one we're gonna be using pretty soon. And so uh, this basically just opens the file, reads all the bytes, and then um, tells you how many bytes were in the file, okay? And then of course, since we have a uh, read, we need a way to write a certain number of bytes. So we have the file system read here uh, equivalent, which is just the write. So this just takes the data size, a pointer to the data, and then um, tells you how many bytes were actually written, and then true or false if that was successful or not, okay? And that is actually all we are gonna do for the file system right now. We're not gonna write a virtual file system, at least not yet, but if we decide to do that down in the future, um, we can actually abstract it behind this, which is one of the reasons I'm doing it this way, okay? All right, so now that we have that out of the way, uh, we need to actually go ahead and declare some of this stuff, right? Um, or define some of this stuff, rather. So I'm gonna create a new file, call it filesystem.c, and we're going to need filesystem.h, obviously. We are going to need the core logger and memory. And we're also gonna need a few of the standard libraries. And uh, this is one of the reasons I was saying that uh, eventually we're going to wind up refactoring this as well. But just to get things up and running, I'm actually gonna utilize um, these standard libraries for now. Um, and then eventually we will be going back and fine tuning this per platform. So that is the other reason I'm putting this here for platform uh, within platform is because eventually there will be a file system for Win32, um, Mac OS, and Linux instead of just doing it this way. So this is temporary, but um, yeah, anyway. Okay, so uh, looking here, the first thing that we have in this list is a check to see if the file system exists. So this one's actually pretty str straightforward. Uh, we are going to be using the uh, stat, which is uh, this library right here. And so basically uh, all this does is say, uh, does the file actually exist? And it just takes the path here um, and outputs that to this structure and then says if there was no error code returned. Okay, so that is file system exists. So the next thing we're gonna fill out is file system open. And basically this is going to uh, take the parameters that we provide and translate them into parameters that the library understands. So. First thing we're gonna do is start off by setting uh, the out handle valid uh, to false and making sure that uh, the handle itself um, within that, that void pointer is zeroed out as well. Then we are going to uh, basically create a string for the mode, right? And we're basically going to take the combination of uh, the mode that was provided here and this binary, and we are going to uh, build a string based on that. So what I mean by that is we will wind up with something like this. So basically what this is gonna say is it's gonna start off saying if both the read and write are set, meaning they're not equal to zero, then it is gonna use the W plus. And then if uh, it's binary, it's going to say W plus B, otherwise it'll say W plus. And uh, that will um, give us the appropriate string uh, to feed to the library. So. Likewise, we have um, one here for read. So if the read um, is only um, set and not the write, then we will use RB uh, for um, read binary or just R if it's text mode. And then same thing here for uh, write mode. And then um, obviously if for some reason one of these cases doesn't catch it, uh, then we will wind up in a error case here, which we will print out. Um, and then, you know, we can troubleshoot that. But uh, this should cover all of our cases. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do is actually attempt to open the file. And so that is basically just using uh, fopen. And we pass it the path as well as the constructed mode string. And that should return to us a pointer to a file. And if that returns zero, then we say, okay, well, we couldn't open the file and it returns false. However, if that is successful, then we will go ahead and set the out handle, uh, handle to the file. And then uh, we'll say uh, this 
handle valid is true, okay? And then uh, obviously if we've reached that, then we are successful, so we should also return true. File system close is actually really simple. So uh, basically this looks to see if we have a handle on the handle. Um, it F closes that and then zeros everything out. File system read line is actually um, somewhat straightforward. So the first thing that we do is we check to see if uh, we have a file handle, right? Uh, because if we don't, um, then obviously we don't want to, um, we're not gonna be able to do anything with it if we don't have a proper handle, right? And so if we don't have it, uh, then we would return false. Since we're reading a single line, I am going to make an assumption here that uh, we should be able to fit this into a buffer that is 32,000 uh, characters long. If we need to revisit this, we can. Um, I'm just, again, trying to avoid dynamic allocations if I can. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just reading this into a buffer and then calling fgets into that buffer uh, and then taking the string length and um, allocating uh, here. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm allocating the uh, point to two line buffer and then uh, copying the string and then returning true. I could just write it into this buffer and check to see if it exists and leave that uh, to external, but I find this to be a little bit easier to use. So I may revisit this um, and maybe add a Boolean that says uh, whether or not we want to um, have the memory created automatically for us or whether we want to require it be passed in instead. Uh, but for now, this is just a little bit easier to use in my opinion. So, okay. So the next thing uh, that we need is the ability to write a line. And this is actually pretty straightforward stuff as well. So again, we check to see if the handle exists. Uh, we, so we go ahead and call uh, F puts and then uh, write out the text. And then um, after that, uh, if we say that the, uh, we are not at the end of the file, meaning that it's still uh, valid, we go ahead and F put C uh, and we tack on a new line to the end of that file. And then uh, we go ahead and flush the stream so it is written to the file immediately. As I have here in the comment, this prevents data loss in the event of a crash, right? Because if we don't immediately close the file um, and the program clash crashes, uh, the, the stream never gets flushed, meaning it never actually gets written to the file. So we do this immediately, meaning it gets written to the file right then and there. We don't have to wait for the file to be closed. And then here, um, we just return uh, whether or not the result is equal to end of file, which indicates success for us, okay? Next, uh, we have the file system read, which allows us to read a certain number of bytes. This is actually even simpler than above. So uh, this guy basically uh, checks to make sure that we have uh, the handle and makes sure that the out data actually exists, and then sets the out bytes read to uh, the result of an F read call. And basically what we say is we have uh, one thing to be read out at the size that we passed in, and that gets set to out data. And then we do a check to see if out bytes read is uh, the same as the data size, which was passed in. So basically, did we read the amount that we expected to read? Um, and if we didn't, we return false. If we do, we return true, okay? And next, we want to read all bytes in a file. So uh, this is the function for that. It works very similar um, to this above file, except uh, the only thing this does is it basically seeks to the end of the file, gets how big the file is, goes back to the beginning of the file, and then goes ahead and reads the file, okay? So this just handles that. And then of course we have our file system write which writes a given number of bytes to the provided handle. So here we call f write. Uh, we have data, data size. Um, we write one of those at this size, etc., etc., etc. Again, we make sure to flush uh, so that in case we crash or something, uh, that result is still written to the file. Okay, great. 
So this pretty much does it for our file system, at least for now. It's pretty simple, like I said, um, but it is a necessary thing to have set up. So with that working, let's go ahead and close those out. Uh, let's go ahead and save that. And we can now go back to our create shader module file. So with that, we can now include that header that I mentioned before, which is platform file system. And we can now get rid of that to do. And we can go ahead and obtain our file handle. So we'll go ahead and call file system open and we'll pass the constructed file name. Uh, we'll say it's in read mode, um, that the uh, binary is true, and then we will output to the handle here. And of course, um, if that fails for some reason, we will throw an error and return false. Okay. So now that we have that, uh, we need to actually read the entire file as binary. And this is because, again, that file, uh, the SPV file, is uh, bytecode. So we want to take all the bytes out of that file um, as they are and use them directly. So that is where we're going to use our file system read all bytes. Okay. And of course, if we have an error with that, uh, we throw that error in return. All right, and once we have done that, uh, I go ahead and set the shader stages uh, appropriate at the appropriate index, um, the create info, the code size, and the P code, okay? So this is just um, how we take uh, the code out of that file and assign it to that structure uh, so that we can then load it. And then uh, we are actually done with the file at that point, so we can go ahead and close it. And at this point, uh, we actually are going to call something called VK create shader module. And this is what actually does the work, right? So um, we have our create info here. Now we go ahead and create the shader module. And all this does is takes the device, the create info, uh, the allocator here, uh, we're just passing zero. In fact, I probably should change that. I'll just change that zero actually to be context allocator instead, since we should be uh, always pointing to that. And then of course, if this uh, fails for some reason, we'll go ahead and assert on that, okay? So that is the shader module creation. Uh, there is one more thing that we'll need to do, and that is to set up the shader stage info, right? So uh, this is the uh, create info that we want to go ahead and save off. So I'm just gonna go ahead and fill this out. And basically all this is, is we just need an S type, uh, the stage which we've passed in um, here, which is shader stage flag, uh, the actual module itself, which is what we just got here. And then the P name, which I'm setting to main. Uh, this is actually the entry point to the shader itself, um, which is basically just the function and it searches for that by name. So in this case, we're using main. Uh, if we wanted to define multiple entry points to a shader, I suppose we could do that um, and then just load the same shader code in for different modules and we could call um, a different function if we wanted to, but I'm gonna go ahead and standardize on main um, because uh, that is sort of the standard and what I wanna use um, when I go to write OpenGL code, uh, it's also gonna use main. So I just wanna be kind of consistent uh, in that regard. So we set that up and then uh, we go ahead and say, all right, well, if the, um, if the file buffer actually exists, let's go ahead and free it, right? Because that would have been created uh, here by this file system read all bytes. And then uh, go ahead and zero that out just to be sure. And then we will return true for success. Okay, so uh, this is pretty much everything that needs to be done in shader utils for now, right? So now we can create a shader module and load in files. So uh, this is an important first step in actually creating our shader. So there's a couple more things I want to go ahead and set up uh, before we end here. So if we go back to our Vulkan object shader, and we can now include, render Vulkan, Vulkan shader utils. 
And if we hover over this guy, we now see that that is defined. So that is all hooked up and ready to go, okay? All right, so uh, that is the shader module creation. Uh, the next thing that we will wind up doing is probably uh, descriptors, um, which we will come back to that in a separate video. All right, so. If you recall, in our post build SH, we actually had defined this built in shader, uh, built in object shader vert GLSL and frag GLSL. So now it might make sense to you as to why we actually call these things the way that we did, because we are actually building these things out uh, in code, and this sort of is the other half of that. So, really quickly, uh, I'm going to walk through the process of creating a basic shader here so that uh, we can actually test to see if this works properly, okay? So uh, the first thing, so if we go under assets, all we have now is this dot get keep, right? And so I want to actually create a new folder here and we're gonna call this shaders, okay? And we're gonna create two files. Uh, the first is going to be this built-in object shader vert GLSL, okay? And the second one is going to be almost the same thing except it's going to be called frag GLSL, okay? And these will be the shader files uh, that get written for each one of uh, these appropriate stages, okay? So at the top of our shader file, we're going to use uh, version 450 and we're going to flag this extension. Now I'm not gonna go into what this extension does right now, we'll come back to that. But uh, we do want to actually enable that particular extension for something we're gonna be doing in a bit. And for right now, I'm going to create a void main, right? And you'll notice that the syntax of this is very similar to C. Uh, it's not exactly C obviously, but it should look pretty familiar to you. And the only thing that we're going to do, we are going to set something in here called layout, location zero in VEC3 in position. And I'm not going to explain in depth what this is right now, but so what this allows us to do is take the individual vertex data that we are gonna pass, the individual um, positions, if you will, uh, as well as other information, and transform them in such a way that eventually gets passed on to the fragment shader for coloring, and then that eventually gets output to the screen, right? And so uh, for now, we're just going to take in position, and then we are going to do something, we're gonna to write to something called gl underscore position. And this is, um, it's a little bit weird that it's referencing gl, but that is because we are using glsl. Um, and compiling, compiling that into Spur V. So um, our, in OpenGL, GL position is basically the final vertex position that gets passed on to the fragment shader. And so for right now, all I'm gonna do is uh, I'm just gonna pass this in position. However, uh, you can't just pass uh, a vector three to GL position because GL position is actually a vector four. So I need to convert this to a vector four by typing back four and then open parenthesis, comma, 1.0, okay? And again, I know this is a lot being thrown at you at once. Uh, I, I promise uh, I will go over this stuff in more detail and why we're doing some of these things. But um, for now, basically just know that this basically takes in position X, Y, Z, and tax a W coordinate of 1.0, and then takes that vector four and assigns it to GL position. So technically right now, we're not really transforming it at all. We're just using it as is, okay? So that uh, is all there is for the vertex shader. Again, there's gonna be a lot more that we're gonna be adding to that uh, over time, but for now, that's all that there is. So let's jump over to the fragment shader. And again, we're gonna use version 4.5.0, and we're gonna enable this extension. Again, ignore that for right now. Uh, I'll come back to it later. 
So the fragment shader is what determines the ultimate color of the fragment that gets output to um, the image that we are rendering to, which ultimately in our case is gonna be written to the screen. So here, uh, it, as opposed to our vertex shader where we have a input marked by this in keyword here, in our fragment shader, we actually need to denote an output, right? And in this case, it's going to be out color is what we're gonna call it, and it's a vector four. And uh, remember when I was talking about vectors could be used for things other than just positions, this is an example of that. So we're actually gonna be outputting an RGBA color. Uh, in, our, and in our case, we're actually going to keep that dirt simple. So we're gonna set out color equal to vec4, and we're just gonna set 1.0. And when you do this, uh, it basically sets 1.0 to um, X, Y, Z, and, um, and W, or alpha, or RGBA, if you will. And so for now, uh, we're just gonna use a hard-coded uh, color value. We could put any, anything in here we want, um, but for now, we're just gonna use white, okay? And that is all that should be required for our shaders. So I'm gonna go ahead and build the application real quick. It uh, looks like we have some errors. I might have missed something here. Ah, yes I did. Somehow, what has happened here? Okay, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Looks like this got pasted in somehow. Okay, I'm not exactly sure when I did that. Let's go ahead and build everything again. Okay, uh, looks like we have some sort of warning in Vulcan shader.c. Oh, that's because we're not returning anything. Let's go ahead and return true here for now. Build again, okay. So that works. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set a breakpoint here on line 15. And then uh, we're also gonna need to run our post build process. So uh, to do that, I'm just gonna press F1 and then run task. And then we want to run post build. See what we get. Uh, permission denied, okay. So that, that means that I probably forgot to chmod that file. So this is a Linux specific thing, but So I'm just gonna chmod plus x to postbuild.sh, making it executable. Let's go ahead and uh, run that again. Okay, and it, we didn't get any errors here, so I think our shader compilation was successful. We can verify that by going into bin, assets, shaders, and we see here that uh, the SPV files are there. Now our postbuild does actually copy the GLSL files here for um, just for our reference so that we can look at them. Um, but uh, yeah, so we have uh, those SPV files there. That all looks good. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and hook up uh, this Vulkan object shader create um, because we actually haven't uh, hooked that up in our backend yet. So actually this won't be called yet. So we'll go to uh, renderer, whoops. We'll go to Vulkan backend. So first thing that we're gonna to wanna to do is we are going to want to include our object shader. So I'm actually gonna do that here uh, at the bottom. And I'm just going to denote that our shaders are gonna be included here, okay? And then right here, uh, just above where we are saying we created the render uh, successfully. So we are going to call our Vulkan object shader create. So it takes the context and then a pointer to something called the object shader, which we've not yet created. So let's go ahead to the context. And right below recreating swap chain, we'll go ahead and add our object shader. Okay. And so let's go ahead and go back and we should be able to build. Looks like we have a 
that should be a dot. Okay. So uh, here we have everything compiled successfully. Looks like we're good to go. So let's go ahead and run this. And we've hit our breakpoint. So we will go ahead and step into our shader module. So we've created our file name. Well, name. And it looks, I mean, it looks like we have done that correctly. So that should be fine. Let's go ahead and make sure that that opened. It did open successfully. We're going to read uh, all the bytes from that. Uh, so our code size here is 936. That seems roughly correct. Uh, if we look at the size of the file, uh, which one is this actually? So our shader stage is the vertex, so we're doing the vertex one first. So if we look at the file, uh, we'll just do open containing folder. And if we look at the size of this, it's 936 bytes. So we know that that is correct. Okay. So we'll go ahead and uh, create the shader module. Looks like that was successful. Okay, we'll go ahead and copy all of this over. And we return true, right? So uh, we'll go ahead and do this once more. This time I'm gonna step over it for this stage. And it looks like uh, we have gone ahead and loaded our shader modules successfully. So uh, nothing to display on the screen this time around, but uh, we do at least know that our uh, our shader pipeline is correct. Uh, we can compile our shaders, we can load them. And so next time we'll move on to some things like uh, our setting up our descriptors, our graphics pipeline, um, and all of those kind of things. So um, with that, uh, I think this has run on long enough. So thank you guys so much for watching. Please toss the video a thumbs up if you liked it. If you haven't already, consider subscribing. Hit, hit the little bell icon there to get notified as to when new videos in this or other series drops. And I will see you guys next time.